And now I'll begin our service. Tense, hello, bonjour. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous people, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us, and the youth who inspire us. A tradition that dates back centuries, land recognition now calls us to acknowledge we are Treaty 6 people, to remember our responsibility to deepen our understanding of the treaty, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation, and healing. And today's service is all about that. My name's Lorian Kennedy, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm your service leader this week, and I'm glad you've joined us here today, here and on Zoom. A special welcome this morning to those who are first-time visitors or consider themselves newcomers or are returning after an extended absence. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community where you're welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be. Where you're welcome regardless of your gender, who you love, your wealth or your education where reverence for the earth and a belief in the dignity of every person inform our ethics, where music is an expression of our joy, worship brings us together to celebrate what's important in our lives, and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Our speaker this morning is Susan Rotan, an active member of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton and my friend, who has graciously offered to share this service with us. And after the service, we invite you all to visit, chat, and discuss any questions you may have. 
Next week, come in person or online for a fun hymn sing, and um, Jennifer McMillan will be playing our requests, and our choir harmonia will be here. And in the final service of October, Jethro Ulrich, the son of Carl Ulrich, one of our members, will be here to speak about his experience as a 60s scoop person. Susan. Thank you, Lorian. I've prepared my service today uh, with a heart and mind focused on the genocidal damage done by the residential schools policy that began on the prairies in 1883, the year that the CPR train reached Alberta. Three churches in particular, Roman Catholic, Anglican and Presbyterian, eagerly adopted a government program that would pay them so much ahead to run boarding schools for Indigenous children. Alberta had 25 of these schools, more than any other province. The three churches competed for children because they needed to keep their schools full to get the maximum federal grants. I have chosen today to mark this tragedy by talking about what life was like before the residential schools, before the settler culture flooded across Alberta when the CPR train pulled into Calgary. Only by appreciating the life that existed before the Europeans arrived can we understand what was lost. And now Lorian is going to light the chalice as we share these words from Deborah Burrell. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears for the future, and our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy and peace. Our opening words come from Embers, the Book of Meditations by Indigenous writer Richard Wagamese. I've been considering the phrase, all my relations, for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we are all related, that we are all connected, that we all belong to each other. The most important word is all, not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, pray like me, speak like me, or behave like me, all my relations. That means every person, just as it means every rock, mineral, blade of grass, and creature. We live because everything else does. If we were to choose collectively to live that teaching, the energy of our change of consciousness would heal each of us and heal the world. Now, uh, if you would don your mask and join us in singing hymn number 1023, Building Bridges.
intervals of joy and concern is a moment in our week that gives us the opportunity to hear and express something important that's going on in our lives and gives us and the lives around us to celebrate <clears throat> what brings us joy and share what's weighing on our hearts. For those of you who are online, we're going to bring you into the church so we can see you on the screen in just a moment. And um, you can raise your hand, just physically raise your hand and we'll have a look at the screen and see who'd like to say something. And for those in the building, you're invited to come forward in a moment to speak and then light your candle as the next person speaks. Um, we're also happy to bring the microphone to you if you wish. I will light one additional candle um, for those whose joys and concerns remain in our heart. Please join me for the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. And each week in our service we take a moment to acknowledge the gifts we both bring to and receive from this community gifts of talent, time, and treasure. And today we're blessed with the musical talent of Sheila Killoran, as well as the gifts of time and service from those who plan and uh, provide all the background to the service and our service techs. Today we have Hannah and Rebecca and Bill, who's online. And if you wish your, to make your contribution to this community, and our work, the information for doing so is on the right-hand side of this slide. So please now don your masks and join me as we sing From You I Receive. Sheila will play it through and then we will sing. If you'd like to join us now again to sing Wake Now My Senses, it's hymn 292 if you have a hymn book. Um, thank you, Sheila.
The ring road around Edmonton is named for Anthony Henday, the famous Hudson's Bay man who, in 1754, headed off from the company fort on the Hudson Bay and trekked across the prairies all the way to the foothills of the Rockies. It was a historic expedition, and his notes from that trip are an important record of life on the prairies before the settlers came. He's a Canadian hero. One of the residences at the University of Alberta is also named for Henday. But here's the thing. Stephen Bone, author of A New History of the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, points out that what Henday did was the same long trip that Cree traders did every year for hundreds of years. They hauled furs from the deep interior, negotiated with the various First Nations along the way, and ended up at a trading post on Hudson Bay where they bargained with the Bay men for the best price. And when Hendy made his trip, he had several dozen indigenous people guiding him, paddling the canoe, feeding him, translating for him the languages of the various tribes they met along the way. He was the tourist. They were the professionals. This was their home of many years, the Cree and Chippewyan of the northern forests who traveled by canoe and ate fish, the Blackfoot of the south who rode horses and ate buffalo. Bone also describes a famous trek up into the Arctic in 1770, in which the tourist, Samuel Hearn, would become a celebrated hero. The actual leader of that trip was an indigenous man named Matt Nabby, whom Bone calls one of the greatest explorers of the north of the 18th century. There are no schools or highways named for Matt Nabby that I know of. Matt Nabby traveled with a huge group, including his six wives and numerous children. The wives reportedly were good for carrying heavy packs, pitching the tents, making the food, and keeping their husbands warm at night. Because there was no written language before the Europeans, we only get glimpses of what life was like before the settlers invaded the prairies. But those glimpses are so important. We can't fully appreciate the devastation that hit these people in the late 1800s if we can't see what life was like before the disasters happened before the disappearance of the buffalo, the decline of the fur trade, the flood of settlers into Alberta starting in 1883, the spread of European diseases, and then most horrifically, the residential schools. We do get glimpses, however, and more all the time as research expands. We now know that trade routes across the continent had been used for centuries by indigenous traders. It was such trade routes that brought European horses up from Mexico and guns down from the Hudson Bay forts. And for centuries, the Northern Cree of Ontario traded their furs for the corn of the Southern Ontario Iroquois. Traditional beadwork made in the prairies has little shells beaded into it that come from the West Coast which was all part of the trade that happened between West Coast First Nations and the people of the prairies. That trade involved traveling great distances with no modern transportation, so these trade gatherings were usually once a year. They were accompanied by huge celebrations, negotiations, singing and dancing. Often women from one tribe ended up in another tribe as brides. When the Hudson Bay Company began its fur trading around 1670, it wisely adopted the same elaborate trading customs with gifts and banquets and discussions lasting weeks. We should not idealize that pre-European life, of course. There were years of great hardship and there was violence. The Chippewyan and Inuit of Alberta's north fought over access to caribou hunting grounds. But still, there was a harmony between the people and the environment around them that we can only marvel at. 
Indigenous people used the natural resources around them, but never to an extent that threatened that ecological balance. And there was beauty. The artwork of the first people of the area we live in was the decoration in beads and porcupine quills of their clothes and moccasins, art suited to people who were on the move most of the year. The native peoples of this country didn't own the land or the buffalo or the caribou. They used the resources, but respectfully and with reverence. Their fellow creatures were their relations. For example, the two social groups of the Clinket Nation on the West Coast were called the Eagle and the Raven. And there are endless stories still today about both of those birds. Nor did they punish wrongdoers in the way Europeans always have done. Instead, they shunned them and they shamed them, helping them to understand the wrong they had done. Nor did they send their children off to school. Children learned from being a key part of everything that happened in each community. The author of Bone argues that the first century of the fur trade when the Hudson's Bay Company held complete control over the Canadian prairies was a time of healthy relationship between the First Nations of the prairies and the traders. With a few rare exceptions like Hendy and Bone, the Bay men stayed in their forts on the bay and the beaver skins came to them. The Cree became specialists at acting as intermediaries who visited the inland hunters took their skins and transported them up to the bay forts. Afterwards, they returned with the payment, typically metal pots and knives, to the appropriate tribes. As European habits and technology invaded the prairies, that balanced life started to change. After the British took control of Quebec in 1760, a secondary fur trade started out of Montreal following the creation of the Northwest Company. The men of the Northwest Company worked a lot harder than the Bay men. From their base in what is now Thunder Bay, the, the Northwest traders traveled throughout the prairie provinces, setting up little forts and diverting the furs that would otherwise have gone up to the forts on the bay. They brought with them their preferred trading item, alcohol. They also brought disease. And there were several severe pandemics in the indigenous population with huge loss of life. Eventually, the Bay Company felt the need to compete, and they started building their own forts all over the place. They built Fort Edmonton in 1795, just months after a northwest fort went up near what is now Fort Saskatchewan. All of this and the competition between the two companies expanded the European impact on the First Nations. Hunting buffalo with a horse and a gun rather than on foot with a spear became standard and infinitely easier. And in the 1800s, some part of the buffalo hunt became a commercial enterprise. Buffalo carcasses could be used to make fur robes that then could be taken down to Minnesota and sold to businessmen there. Sadly, overhunting started reducing the buffalo populations from an estimated 60 million in 1600 to near extinction by 1880. Lake hold traps from Europe introduced here in the 18, early 1800s, did the same thing to the beaver. Guns also made disputes between tribes much more violent. The alcohol that the traders brought in caused serious social damage. Many of the fur traders at this time were huge drinkers, not many of them from Scotland, where my ancestors are from. And they shared their bad habits where they're with their indigenous trading partners. This careless overuse of resources is a pattern that still dominates European and North American society. Climate change, such as the summer heat wave and drought that we've experienced this year and last year, are a result. 
The glaciers that feed Alberta's major rivers are melting rapidly, yet that looming water shortage is hardly ever talked about. The famous fish of my childhood, the one we all loved uh, when I grew up in northern Manitoba, was the pickerel. Today, if you want to catch a pickerel in Alberta, you need a special license like that of a big game hunter because they're almost all gone. We are trapped in a global culture of growth at all costs, of disrespecting the earth. When I think about how we can save ourselves, I think about the First Nations of the Canadian Plains. They did without many things that we have, but they had a good life. They were healthy. Their children thrived. We need to learn from them their traditional respect for the environment, their lifestyle close to birds and animals and plants. This worldview of indigenous peoples can be sum, summed up as interconnectedness or as all my relations. We here in Edmonton are so lucky. Our indigenous population is about 80,000, which makes it second only to Winnipeg in Canada. These people have been hard hit by the settler culture, which has been here 140 years, but they still have strong ties to the past. We have terrific indigenous organizations like the Bend Arrow Society, and we have a city government that is trying to recognize and support our strong indigenous roots. The city of Edmonton is a major player in the creation of an indigenous cultural site in White Mud Park that is currently just finishing getting built. It's called the Kichi Aski, or Sacred Land, and is expected to open next year. Unitarians must play our part in restoring indigenous peoples to their rightful place in society. There is a social justice role for us that we must be forever focused on that we take our place in Treaty 6 seriously. We must also embrace the spiritual teachings of First Nations people, find our way back to deep ties with the earth and sky. My a tiny attempt this year was to share my garden with the bees. I've discovered there's a lot of really pretty flowers that you can buy and put in your garden that the bees won't have anything to do with, whereas some low-lying uh, ground cover with flowers the bees go crazy for. So now I'm only going to buy flowers that the bees say it's okay. Finally, I, I would think that just as West Coast First Nations have always celebrated and valued the raven, we here in Edmonton should celeb celebrate our own rascal, the magpie. They're smart, tough, playful, and they like Edmonton. They are for sure part of our relations. Blessed be. And now we will have a poem, I believe, read by somebody online. Cassie. 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 Yes, hello. Um, this poem is by Louise Half, whose Cree name is Sky Dancer. It was written this year to honor the children of the Kamloops Residential School. Half was raised on the Saddle Lake First Nation east of Edmonton and attended Blue Quills Residential School in St. Paul. She is Canada's Parliamentary Poet Laureate and the poem is entitled, The Past is Always Our Present. A cradle board hangs from a tree a beaded moss bag is folded in a small chest. A child's moccasin is tucked into a skunk pipe bag. Children's shoes in a ghost dance. A mother clutches these, palms held against her face. A river runs between her fingers. A small boy covered in soot on all fours, a naked toddler plays in the water. 
while her cocoon skirt is wet to her calves. How tall are you now? She asked. I'm bigger than the blueberry shrub. Oh, as tall as an aspen, where my birth was buried. See my belly button? Each had dragged a rabbit to the tent, a teepee, watched expert hands skin, butcher, make berry soup for dinner. Boy falls a robin with <laughs> a slingshot. He is shown how to skewer the breast, roast the bird on hot coals. He will not kill without purpose again. The teepee, tent, the log shack are empty. Trees crane their heads through the teepee flaps. The tent door through the cracks of the mud shack. A mother's long wail from 1890 carried in the wind. A grandparent pokes embers, a sprinkle of tobacco, cedar, sweetgrass, fungus, sage, swirls upward. Children's creeks trickle in their sleep, a blanket of deep earth covered fingers in, entwined, arms around each other. We have been waiting. It is time to release this storm that consumes all this nation. Awasis, this spirit light, these angels dance in the flame. The bones will share their stories. Listen, act. These children are ours, could be yours. Thank you for that. I, my final reading is from the final report of the National, National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Referring to the struggles of indigenous people to keep their identity and culture during more than a century of a colonial oppression, the commission wrote, too many Canadians know little or nothing about the deep historical roots of these conflicts. This lack of historical knowledge has serious consequences for First Nations Inuit and Métis peoples, and for Canada as a whole. In government circles, it makes for poor public policy decisions. In the public realm, it reinforces racist attitudes and fuels civic distrust between Abor Aboriginal people and other Canadians. Too many Canadians still do not know the history of Aboriginal people's contributions to Canada or understand that by virtue of the historical and modern treaties and negotiated by our government, we are all treaty people. History plays an important role in reconciliation. To build for the future, Canadians must look to and learn from the past. So, thank you, Susan. We have lots to learn. I'd like uh, to now ask Sheila to play hymn 318, We Would Be One. And we can stand or sit, whatever we like, but uh, we are going to be masked to sing. So join us in singing, We Would Be One.
the blessing of truth be upon us, the power of love direct us and sustain us. And may the peace of this community preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth until we meet again. Thank you. And our chimes to close our service. After this, please stay and visit with each other. And for those of you on Zoom, you are invited to visit with each other by remaining in the main Zoom room or joining a breakout room. <laughs>